Note and Dedication of Montezuma's Daughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard Note the more unpronounceable of the Aztec names are shortened in many instances out of consideration for the patience of the reader. Thus Popocatapetl becomes Popo, Huitzilcote becomes Huitzel, and so on. The prayer in chapter 26 is freely rendered from Jordanet's French translation of Fray Bernardino de Sahagun's History of New Spain, written shortly after the conquest of Mexico. Book 6 Chapter 5. To which the monumental work, and to Prescott's admirable history, the author of this romance is much indebted. The portents described as heralding the fall of the Aztec Empire, and many of the incidents and events written of in this story, such as the annual personation of the god Tezcatlipoca, by a captive, distinguished for his personal beauty and destined to sacrifice, are in the main historical. The noble speech of the Emperor Guatemoc to the Prince of Tacuba, uttered while they were both suffering beneath the hands of the Spaniards, is also authentic. Dedication My dear Jeb, strange as were the adventures and escapes of Thomas Wingfield, once of this parish, whereof these pages tell, your own can almost equal them in these latter days and since a fellow feeling makes us kind you at least they may move to a sigh of sympathy among many a distant land you know that in which he loved and fought following vengeance and his fate and by your side i saw its relics and its peoples its vulcans and its valleys you know even where lies the treasure which three centuries and more ago he helped to bury the countless treasure that an evil fortune held us back from seeking. Now the Indians have taken back their secret, and though many may search, none will lift the graven stone that seals it. Nor shall the light of day shine again upon the golden head of Montezuma. So be it. The wealth which Cortes wept over, and his Spaniards sinned and died for, is for ever hidden yonder by the shores of the bitter lake whose water gave up to you that ancient horror, the veritable and sleepless god of sacrifice, of whom I would not rob you, and for my part I do not regret the loss. What cannot be lost? What to me seem of more worth than the dead hero Guatemoc's gems and jars of gold are the memories of true friendship shown to us far away beneath the shadow of the slumbering woman, and it is in gratitude for these that I ask your permission to set your name within a book which, were it not for you, would never have been written. I am, my dear Jeb, always sincerely yours. H. Ryder Haggard The slumbering woman is the volcano Iztikahuacl in Mexico. Ditchingham, Norfolk, October the 5th, 1892 To J. Gladwin Jeb, Esquire Note, worn out prematurely by life of hardship and extraordinary adventure, Mr. Jebb passed away on March the 18th, 1893, taking with him the respect and affection of all who had the honour of his friendship. The author has learned with pleasure that the reading of his tale in proof and the fact of its dedication to himself afforded him some amusement and satisfaction in the intervals of his suffering. H.R.H., March the 22nd, 1893 End of Note and Dedication Read by Patrick, 79「Chapter 1 of Montezuma's Daughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Why Thomas Wingfield Tells His Tale 
now glory be to god who has given us this victory it is true the strength of spain is shattered her ships are sunk or fled the sea has swallowed her soldiers and sailors by hundreds and by thousands and england breathes again oh they came to conquer to bring the torture and the stake to do us free englishmen as court is did by the indians of anahuac our manner to the slave bench our daughters to dishonour our souls to the loving kindness of the priest our wealth to the emperor and the pope god has answered them with his wings drake has answered them with his guns they are gone and with them the glory of spain oh i thomas wingfield heard the news to-day on this very thursday in the bungay market-place whither i went to gossip and to sell the apples which these dreadful gales have left me as they hung upon my trees for there had been rumours of this and that but here in bungay was a man named young of the youngs of yarmouth who had served in one of the yarmouth ships in the fight of the gravelinas ay and sailed north after the spaniards till they were lost in the scottish seas little things lead to great men say but here great things lead to little for because of these tidings it comes about that i thomas wingfield of the lodge of the parish of ditchingham in the county of norfolk being now of a great age and having only a short time to live turned to pen and ink ten years ago namely in the year fifteen hundred and seventy eight it pleased her majesty our gracious queen elizabeth who at that date visited this county that i should be brought before her at norwich there and then saying that the fortune of it had been reached her she commanded me to give her some particulars of the story of my life or rather of those twenty years more or less which i spent among the indians at the time when Cortes conquered their country of anahuac which is now known as mexico but almost before i could begin my tale it was time for her to start for cossi to hunt deer and she said it was her wish that i should write the story down that she might read it and moreover that if it were but half as wonderful as it promised to be i should end up my days as sir thomas wingfield to this i answered her majesty that pen and ink were tools i did had no skill in yet i would bear her command in mind then i made bold to give her a great emerald that once hung upon the breast of montezuma's daughter and of many a princess before her and at the sight of it her eyes glistened brightly as the gem for this queen of ours loves such costly playthings indeed had i so desired i think that i might then and there have struck a bargain and set the stone against a title but i who for many years had been the prince of a great tribe had no wish to be a knight so i kissed the royal hand and so tightly did it grip the gem within that the knuckle joint shone white and i went my ways coming back home to this my house by waveney on that same day now the queen's wish that i should set down the story of my life remained in my mind and for a long time i have desired to do it before life and story end together the labour indeed is great to one unused to such tasks but why should i fear labour who am so near to the holiday of death i have seen things that no other englishman has seen which are worthy to be recorded my life has been a most strange many a time it has pleased god to preserve it when all seem lost and this perchance he has done that the lesson of it might become known to others for there is a lesson in it and in the things that i have seen and it is that no wrong can ever bring about a right that wrong will breed wrong at last 
and be it in man or people, will fall upon the brain that thought it and the hand that wrought it. Look now at the fate of Cortes, that great man whom I have, have known clothed with power like a god. Nearly forty years ago, so I have heard, he died poor and disgraced in Spain. He, the conqueror! Yes, and I have learned also that his son, Don Martin, has been put to torture in that city, which the father won, with so great cruelties for Spain. Malinche, she whom the Spaniards named Marina, the chief and best loved of all the women of this same Cortes, foretold it to him in her anguish, when after all that had been after she had so many times preserved him and his soldiers to look upon the sun. At the last he deserted her, giving her in marriage to Don Juan Zaramillo. Look again at the fate of Marina herself, because she loved this man Cortes, or Malinche, as the, as the Indians named him after her. She brought evil on her native land for without her aid Tenochtitlan, or Mexico, as they call it now, had never bowed beneath the yoke of Spain. Yes, she forgot her honour in her passion, and what was her reward? What right came to her of her wrongdoing? This was her reward at last, to be given away in marriage to another and a lesser man when her beauty waned as a worn-out beast is sold to a poorer master. Consider also the fate of those great peoples of the land of Anahuac. They did evil that good might come. They sacrificed the lives of thousands of their false gods, that their wealth might increase, and peace and prosperity be theirs throughout the generations. And now the true God has answered them. For wealth he has given them desolation, for peace the sword of the Spaniard, for prosperity the rack and the torment of the day of slavery. For this is what they did sacrifice, offering their own children on the altars of Huitzel and Tezcat. And the Spaniards themselves, who in the name of mercy have wrought cruelties greater any that were done by the benighted Aztecs, who, in the name of Christ, daily violate his law to the uttermost extreme. Say, shall they prosper? Shall their evil doing bring them welfare? <laughs> I am old, and cannot live to see the question answered, though even now it is in the way of answering. Yet I know that their wickedness shall fall upon their own heads, and I seem to see them, the proudest of the peoples of the earth, bereft of fame and wealth and honour, a starveling remnant happy in nothing save their past. What Drake began at Gravelines, God will finish in many another place and time till at last Spain is of no more account and lies as low as the empire of Montezuma lies today. Thus it is in these great instances, of which all the world may know, and thus it is even in the life of so humble a man as I, Thomas Wingfield. Heaven indeed has been merciful to me, giving me time to repent my sins. Yet my sins have been visited on my head, on me, who took his prerogative of vengeance from the hand of the Most High. It is just, and because it is so, I wish to set out the matters of my life's history that others may learn from it. For many years this has been in my mind, as I have said, though to speak truth it was her majesty the queen who first set the scene but only on this day when i have heard for certain of the fate of the armada does it begin to grow and who can say if ever it will come to flower for this tidings has stirred me strangely 
bringing back my youth and the deeds of love and war and wild adventure which i have been mingled in fighting for my own hand and for guatemoc and the people of the otomie against these same spaniards as they have not been brought back for many years indeed it seems to me and this is no rare thing with the aged as though there in the far past my true life lay and all the rest were nothing but a dream from the window of the room wherein i write i can see the peaceful valley of the waveney beyond its stream are the common lands golden with gorse the ruined castle and the red roofs of the bungay town gathered about the tower of st mary's church yonder far away are the king's forests of stow and, and the fields of flixton abbey to the right the steep bank is green with the earsham oaks to the left the vast marshlands spotted with cattle stretch on to beckles and lowestoft while behind me my gardens and orchards rise in terraces up the tuffery hill that in old days was known as the earl's vineyard all these are about me and yet in this hour they are as though they were not for the valley of the waveney i see the vale of tenochtitlan for the slopes of stow the snowy shapes of the vulcans popo and istak for the spire of earsham and the towers of ditchingham of bungay and of beckles the soaring pyramids of the sacrifice gleaming with the sacred fires and for the cattle in the meadows the horsemen of cortes sweeping to war it comes back to me that was life the rest is but a dream once more i feel young and should i be spared so long i will set down the story of my my youth before i am laid in yonder churchyard and lost in the world of dreams long ago i had begun it but it was only in the last christmas day that my dear wife died and while she lived i knew that this task was better left undone indeed well to be frank it was thus with my wife she loved me i i believe as few men have the fortune to be loved and there is lo much in my past that jarred upon the love of hers moving her to a jealousy of the dead that was not the less deep because it was so gentle and so closely coupled with forgiveness for she had a secret sorrow that ate at her heart away although she never spoke of it but one child was born to us and this child died in infancy nor for all her prayers did it please god to give her another and indeed remembering the words of otomie i did not expect that it would be so now she was she knew well that yonder across the seas i had children whom i loved by another wife and though they were long dead must always love unalterably and this thought wrung her heart that i had been the husband of another woman she could forgive but that this woman should have borne me children whose memory was still so dear she could not forget if she forgave it she who was childless why it was so being but a man i cannot say for who can know all the mystery of a loving woman's heart but so it was once indeed we quarrelled on the matter it was our only quarrel 
it chanced that when we had been married but two years and our babe was some few days buried in the churchyard of this parish at ditchingham i dreamed a very vivid dream as i slept one night at my wife's side i dreamed that my dead children the four of them for the tallest lad bore in his arm my firstborn that infant who died in the great siege came to me as they had often come when I ruled the people of Otomy in the city of Pines, and talked with me, giving me flowers and kissing my hand. I looked upon their strength and beauty, and was proud at heart, and, in my dream, it seemed as though some great sorrow had been lifted from my mind, as though these dear ones had been lost, and now were found again. Ah! What misery is there like to this misery of dreams that can thus give us back our dead in mockery, and then departing, leave us with a keener woe? Well, I dreamed on, talking with my children in my sleep, and naming them by my beloved names, till at length I woke to look on emptiness, and knowing all my sorrow I sobbed aloud. Now it was early morning, and the light of the August sun streamed through the window, but I, deeming that my wife slept, still lay in the shadow of my dream, as it were, and groaned, murmuring the names of those whom I, I might never see again. It chanced, however, that she was awake, and I had overheard these words which I spoke with the dead, while I was yet asleep and after, and though some of this talk was in the tongue of the Otomy, the most was in English, and knowing the names of my children, she guessed the purport of it all. Suddenly, she sprang from bed and stood over me, and there was such anger in her eyes as I had never seen before, nor had seen since. Nor did it last long, but presently, indeed, it was quenched in tears. "'What is it, wife?' I asked, astonished. "'It is hard,' she answered that I must bear to listen to such talk from your lips, husband. Was it, in, was it not enough that, when all men thought you dead, I wore my youth away faithful to your memory? Though how faithful you were to mine, you know best. Did I ever reproach you because you had forgotten me, and wedded a savage woman in a distant land? oh never dear wife nor had i forgotten you as you know well but what i wonder at is that you should grow jealous now when all cause is done with cannot we be jealous of the dead with the living we may cope but who can fight against the love which death has completed sealing it for ever and making it immortal Still, that I forgive you, for against the woman I can hold my own, seeing that you were mine before you became hers, and are mine after it. But with the children, it is otherwise. They are hers and yours alone. I have no part nor lot in them, and whether they be dead or living, I know well you love them always, and will love them beyond the grave if you may find them there. Already I grow old, who waited twenty years and more before I was your wife, and I shall give you no other children. One I gave you, and God took it back, lest I should be too happy. Yet its name was not on your lips with those strange names. My dead babe is little to you, husband. Here she choked, bursting into tears. Nor did I think it well to answer her that there was this difference in the matter that, whereas 
with the exception of one infant, those sons whom I had lost were almost adolescent. The babes she bore lived but sixty days. Now when the Queen first put in my mind to write down the history of my life, I remember this outbreak of my beloved wife, and seeing that I could write no true tale and leave out of it the story of her, who is also my wife, Montezuma's daughter, Otomie, Princess of the Otomie, and of the children that she gave me, I let the matter lie. For I knew well that though we speak very rarely on the subject during all the many years we passed together, still it was always in Lily's mind. Nor did her jealousy, being of the finer sort, abate at all with age, but rather gathered with the gathering days. That I should execute the task without the knowledge of my wife would not have been possible, for till the very last she watched over my every act, and as I verily believe, divined the most of my thoughts. And so we grew old together, peacefully, and side by side, speaking seldom of that great gap in my life when we were lost to each other, and of all that then befell. At length the end came. My wife died suddenly in her sleep in the eighty-seventh year of her age. I buried her on the south side of the church here, with a sorrow indeed in my heart, but not with sorrow inconsolable, for I know that I must soon join her, and those others whom I have loved. There in that white heaven are my mother and my sister and my sons. There are great Guatemoc, my friend, last of the emperors, and many other companions in war who have preceded me to peace. There, too, though she doubted it, is Otomie, the beautiful and proud. In the heaven which I trust to reach, all the sins of my youth and the errors of my age notwithstanding, it is told us there is no marrying and giving in marriage, and this is well, for I do not know how my wives, Montezuma's daughter, and the sweet English gentlewoman, would agree together were it otherwise. And now to my task. End of chapter 1 Read by Patrick 79 Chapter 2 of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79 Of the Parentage of Thomas Wingfield I, Thomas Wingfield, was born here at Ditchingham, and in this very room where I write to-day. The house of my birth was built, or added to, early in the reign of the seventh Henry, but long before his time some kind of tenement stood here, which was lived in by the keeper of the vineyards, and known as Gardener's Lodge. Whether it chanced that the climate was more kindly in those old times, or the skill of those who tended the fields was greater, I do not know. But this, at least, is true, that the hillside beneath which the house nestles, and which once was the bank of an arm of the sea or of a great broad, was a vineyard in Earl Bigard's days. Long since, as it ceased to grow grapes, though the name of the Earl's Vineyard still clings to all that slope of land which lies between this house and a certain health-giving spring that bubbles up from the bank and half of a mile away, in the waters of which sick folks come to bathe even from Norwich and Lowestoft. 
but sheltered as it is from the east winds to this hour the place has the advantage that gardens planted here are earlier by fourteen days than any others in the countryside and that a man may sit in them coatless in the bitter month of may when on the top of the hill not two hundred paces hence he must shiver in a jacket of otter skins the lodge for so it has always been named in its beginnings having been but a farmhouse faces to the southwest and is built so low that it might well be thought that the damp from the wo the river waveney which runs through the marshes close by would rise in it but this is not so for though in autumn the roke as here in norfolk we name the ground fog hangs about the house at nightfall and in seasons of great flood the water has been known to pour into the stables at the back of it yet being built on sand and gravel there is no healthier habitation in the parish for the rest of the building is of stud work and, and red brick quaint and mellow looking with many corners and gables that in summer are half hidden in roses and other creeping plants with its outlook on the marshes and the common where the lights vary continually with the seasons and even with the hours of the day on the red roofs of bungay town and on the wooded bank that stretches round the ersham lands though there are many larger to my mind there is none pleasanter in these parts here in this house i was born and here doubtless i shall die and having spoken of it at some length as we are wont to do of spots which long custom has endeared us to i will go on to tell of my parentage first then i would set out with a certain pride for who of us does not love an ancient name when we happen to be born to it that i am sprung from the family of the wingfields of wingfield castle in suffolk that lies some two hours on horseback from this place long ago the heiress of the wingfields married a de la pole a family famous in our history the last of whom edmund earl of suffolk lost his head for treason when i was young and the castle passed to the de la poles with her but some offshoots of the old wingfield stock lingered in the neighbourhood perchance there was a bar sinister on their coats of arms i know not and, and, and do not care to know at the least of my fathers and i are of this blood my grandfather was a shrewd man more of a yeoman than a squire though his birth was gentle he it was who brought this place with the lands around it and gathered up some fortune mostly by careful marrying and living for though he had but one son he was twice married and also by trading in cattle now my grandfather was godly minded even to superstition and strange as it may seem having only one son nothing would satisfy him but that boy should be made a priest but my father had little leaning towards the priesthood and life in a monastery though at all seasons my grandfather strove to reason it to into him sometimes with words and examples at other times with the thick cudgel of holly that still hangs over the ingle in the smaller sitting-room the end of it was that the lad was sent to the priory here at bungay where his conduct was of such nature that within a year the prior prayed his parents to take him back and set him in some way of secular life not only so said the prior did my father cause scandal by his actions breaking out of the priory at night and visiting drinking houses and other places but such was the sum of his wickedness he did not scruple to question and make mockery of the very doctrines of the church 
alleging even that there was nothing sacred of the image of the Virgin Mary which stood in the chancel, and shut its eyes in prayer before all the congregation when the priest elevated the host. Therefore, said the prior, I pray you to take back your son, and let him find some other road to the stake than that which runs through the gates of Bungay Priory. <laughs> now, at this story my grandfather was so enraged that he, f he almost fell into a fit. Then, recovering, he bethought him of his cudgel of holly, and would have used it. But my father, who was now nineteen years of age, and very stout and strong, twisted it from his hand, and flung it full fifty yards, saying that no man should touch him, more were he were a hundred times his father. Then he walked away, leaving the prior and my grandfather staring at each other. <laughs> now, to shorten the long tale, the end of the matter was this. It was believed both by my grandfather and the prior that the true cause of my father's contumacy was a passion which he had conceived for a girl of humble birth, a miller's fair daughter who dwelt at Wainford Wills. Perhaps there was truth in this belief, or perhaps there was none. What does it matter? Seeing that the maid married a butcher at Beckles and died years since at the good age of ninety and five? But true or false, my grandfather believed the tale, and knowing well that absence is the surest cure for love, he entered into a plan with the prior that my father should be sent to a monastery at Seville in Spain, of which the prior's brother was abbot and there learn to forget the miller's daughter and all other worldly things. When this was told to my father, he fell into it readily enough, being a young man of spirit and having a great desire to see the world, otherwise, however, than through the gratings of a monastery window. So the end of it was that he went to foreign parts in the care of a party of Spanish monks, who had journeyed here to Norfolk on a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Walshingham. It, it is said that my grandfather wept when he parted with his son, feeling that he should see him no more. Yet so strong was his religion, or rather his superstition, that he did not hesitate to send him away, though for no reason save than that he would mortify his own love and flesh offering his son for a sacrifice, as Abraham would have offered Isaac. But though my father appeared to consent to the sacrifice, as did Isaac, yet his mind was not altogether set on altars and faggots. In short, as he himself told me in years after, his plans were already laid. Thus it chanced that when he had sailed from Yarmouth a year and six months, there came a letter from the abbot of the monastery of Seville to his brother, the prior of St. Mary's at Bungay, saying that my father had fled from the monastery, leaving no trace wherever he had gone. My grandfather was grieved at this tidings, but he said little about it. Two more years passed, and there came other news, namely that my father had been captured, that he had been handed over to the power of the Holy Office, as the accursed Inquisition was then named, and tortured to death at Seville. Oh, when my grandfather heard this, he wept and bemoaned himself that his folly in forcing one into the church, who had no liking for that path, had brought about the shameful end of his only son. After that date, also he broke his friendship with the prior of St. Mary's at Bungay, and ceased offerings to the priory. Still he did not believe that my father was dead in truth, since on the last day of his own life that ended two years later. He spoke of him as a living man, 
and left messages to him as to the management of the lands which now were his. And in the end became clear that his belief was not ill-founded, for one day, three years after the old man's death, there landed at the port of Yarmouth none other than my father, who had been absent some eight years in all. Nor did he come alone, for with him he brought a wife, a young and very lovely lady, who afterwards was my mother. She was a Spaniard of noble family, having been born at Seville, and her maiden name was Donna Luisa de Garcia. Now, of all that befell my father during his eight years of wandering, I cannot speak certainly, for he was very silent on the matter, though I may have need to touch on some of his adventures, but I know it is true that he fell under the power of the Holy Office, for once, when he was a little lad, I bathed with him in the elbow pool, where the river Waveney bends some three hundred yards above the house. I saw that his breast and arms were scored with long white scars, and asked him what had caused them. I remember well how his face changed as I spoke, from kindliness to the hue of blackest hate, and how he answered speaking to himself rather than to me. Devils, he said, devils set on their work by the chief of all devils that live upon the earth and shall reign in hell. Hark you, my son, Thomas, there is a country called Spain where your mother was born, and there these devils abide who torture men and women, aye, and burn them living in the name of Christ. I was betrayed into their hands by him whom I name the chief of all devils, though he was younger than I am by three years, and their pincers and hot irons left these marks on me. Aye, and they would have burnt me alive also, only I escaped, thanks to your mother. But such tales are not for little lads' hearings. And see you never speak of them, Thomas, for the Holy Office has a long arm. You are half a Spaniard, Thomas. Your skin and eyes tell their own tale. But whatever skin and eyes may tell, let your heart give them the lie. Keep your heart, English Thomas. Let no foreign devilments enter here. Hate all Spaniards except your mother, and be watchful, lest her blood should master mine within you. Oh, I was a child then, and scarcely understood his words, or what he meant by them. Afterwards I learned to understand them but too well, for as my father's counsel that I should conquer my Spanish blood, would that I could always have followed it, for I know that from his blood springs the most of such evil as in me. Hence come my fixedness of purpose, or rather obstinacy, and my powers of unchristian hatred that are not small towards those who have wronged me. Well, I have done what I might to overcome these and other faults, but strive as we may. That which is bred in the bone will out in the flesh, as I have seen in many signal instances. There were three of us children, Geoffrey, my elder brother, myself, and my sister Mary, who was one year my junior, the sweetest child and the most beautiful that I have ever known. We were very happy children, and our beauty was the pride of our father and mother, and the envy of other parents. I was the darkest of the three, dark indeed to swarthiness, but in Mary the Spanish blood showed only in her rich eyes of velvet hue, and in the glow upon her cheek that was like the, like the, the blush on a ripe fruit. My mother used to call me her little Spaniard, 
because of my swarthiness, that is, when my father was not near, for such names angered him. She never learned to speak English very well, but he would suffer her to talk in no other tongue before him. Still, when he was not there she spoke in Spanish, of which language, however, I alone of the family became a master, and that more because of certain volumes of old Spanish romances which she had by her, than for any other reason. From my earliest childhood I was fond of such tales, and it was by bribing me with the promise that I should read them that she persuaded me to learn Spanish. For my mother's heart still yearned towards her old sunny shore, and often she would talk of it with us children, more especially in the winter season, which she hated well, as I do. Once I asked her if she wished to go back to Spain. She shivered and answered, Oh, no, for there dwelt one who was her enemy and would kill her. Also her heart with her, was with us children and our father. I wondered if this man who sought to kill my mother was the same as he, of whom my father had spoken of as the chief of the devils. But I only answered that no man could wish to kill one so good and beautiful. Ah, my boy, she said, it is just because I am, or rather have been, beautiful that he hates me. Others would have wedded me beside your dear father, Thomas. And her face grew troubled, as though with fear. Now, when I was eighteen and a half years old, on a certain evening in the month of May, it happened that a friend of my father's, Squire Bozard, late of the hall in this parish, called at the lodge on his road from Yarmouth and in the course of his talk let it fall that a Spanish ship was at an anchor in the roads, laden with merchandise. My father picked up his ears at this, and asked who her captain might be. Squire Bozard answered that he did not know his name, but that he had seen him in the market-place, a, a tall and stately man, richly dressed, with a handsome face and a scar upon his temple. At this news my mother turned pale beneath her olive skin, and muttered in Spanish, Holy Mother, grant that it may not be he. Well, my father also looked frightened, and questioned this squire closely as to the man's appearance, but without learning anything more. Then he bade adieu, with little ceremony, and taking horse, rode away for Yarmouth. Oh, that night my mother never slept, but sat all through it in her nursing chair, brooding over I know not what. As I left her when I went to bed, so I found her when I came from it at dawn. I can remember well, pushing the door ajar to see her face glimmering, glimmering white in the twilight of the May morning, as she sat, her large eyes fixed upon the lattice. "'You have risen early, mother,' I said. "'I have never lain down, Thomas,' she answered. "'Oh, why not? What do you fear?' "'I fear the past and the future, my son. Would that your father were back!' Well, about ten o'clock of that morning, as I was making ready to walk into Bungay to the house of that physician under whom I was learning the art of healing, my father rode up. My mother, who was watching at the lattice, ran out to meet him. Springing from his horse, he embraced her, saying, Be of good cheer, my sweet, it cannot be he. This man has another name. But did you see him? she asked. No, he was out at his ship for the night, and I hurried home to tell you, knowing your fears. It was sure if you had seen him, husband, he may well have taken another name. Oh, I never thought of that, sweet, my father answered, 
but have no fear. Should it be he, and should he dare to set foot in this parish of Ditchingham, there are those who will know how to deal with him. But I am sure that it is not he. Oh, thanks be to jeez you then, she said, and they began talking in a low voice. Now, seeing that I was not wanted, I took my cudgel and started down the bridle path towards the common footbridge, when suddenly my mother called me back. Oh, kiss me before you go, Thomas, she said. You must wonder what all this may mean. One day your father will tell you. It has to do with a shadow which has hung over my life for so many years, but that is, I trust gone for ever. If it be a man who flings it, he had best keep out of this reach of this, I said laughing, and shaking my thick stick. Oh, it is a man, she answered, but one to be dealt with otherwise than by blows. Thomas, should you ever come to chance to meet him? Maybe, mother, but might is the best argument at the last, for the most cunning have a life to lose. Oh, you are too ready to use your strength, son, she said, smiling and kissing me. Remember the old Spanish proverb, He strikes hardest who strikes last. And remember the other proverb, mother, Strike before thou art stricken, I answered and went. When I had gone some ten paces, something prompted me to look back. I know not what. My mother was standing by the open door, her stately shape framed as it were in the flowers of a white creeping shrub that grew upon the wall of the old house. As was her custom, she wore a mantilla of white lace upon her head, the ends of which were wound beneath her chin and the arrangement of it was such that at this distance, for one moment, it put me in mind of the wrappings which are now placed about the dead. I started at this thought, and looked at her face. She was watching me with sad and earnest eyes that seemed to be filled with the spirit of farewell. I never saw her again till she was dead. The end of chapter two. Read by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter three of Montezuma's Daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 3 The Coming of the Spaniard And now I must go back and speak of my own matters. As I have told you, it was my father's wish that I should be a physician, and since I came back from my schooling at Norwich, that was when I had entered on my sixteenth year, I had studied medicine under a doctor who practised his art in the neighbourhood of Bungay. He was a very learned man, and an honest, Grimstone by name, and as I had some liking for the business, I made good progress under him. Indeed, I had learned almost all that he could teach me, and my father purposed to send me to London, there to push on my studies. So soon as I should attain my twentieth year, that is within some five months of the date of the coming of the Spaniard. But it was not fated that I should go to London. Medicine was not the only thing that I studied in those days, however. Squire Bozard of Ditchingham, the same who told my father of the coming of the Spanish ship, had two living children, a son and a daughter, though his wife had borne him many more who died in infancy. The daughter was named Lily, and of my own age, having been born three weeks after me in the same year. Now the Bozards are gone from these parts, for my great-niece, the granddaughter, 
and sole heiress of this son, has married and is issue of another name. But this is by the way. From our earliest days we children, Bozards and Wingfields, lived almost as brothers and sisters, for day by day we met and played together in the snow or in the flowers. Thus it would be hard for me to say when I began to love Lily, or when she began to love me. But I know that when first I went to school at Norwich, I grieved more at losing sight of her than because I must part from my mother and the rest. In all our games she was ever my partner, and I would search the country round for days to find such flowers as she chanced to love. When I came back from school it was the same, though by degrees Lily grew shyer, and I also grew suddenly shy, perceiving that from a child she had become a woman. Still we met often, and though neither of us said anything of it, it was sweet to us to meet. Thus things went on till this day of my mother's death. But before I go further, I must tell that Squire Bozard looked with no favour of friendship between his daughter and myself, and this not because he disliked me, but rather because he would have seen Lily wedded to my elder brother Geoffrey, my father's heir, and not to a younger son. So hard did he grow about the matter at last that we two might scarcely meet except by seeming accident, whereas my brother was we was ever welcome at the hall. And on this account some bitterness arose between us as brothers, as is apt to be in the case when a woman comes between friends, however close. For it must be known that my brother Geoffrey also loved Lily, as all men would have loved her, and with a better right perhaps than I had, for he was my elder by three years, and born to possessions. It might seem indeed that I was somewhat hasty to fall into this state, seeing that at that time, of which I write, I was not yet of age. But young blood is nimble, and moreover mine was half Spanish, and made a man of me when many a pure-bred Englishman is still nothing but a boy. For the blood and the sun that ripens it have much to do with such matters, as I have seen often enough among the Indian peoples of Anahuac, who at the age of fifteen will take themselves a bride of twelve. At least it is certain that when I was eighteen years old, I was old enough to fall in love after such fashion that I never fell out of it again altogether. Although the history of my life may seem to give me the lie when I say so. But I take it that a man may love several women, and yet love one of them the best of all, being true in the spirit to the law which he breaks in the letter. Now, when I had attained nineteen years, I was a man full grown, and writing as I do in extreme old age, I may say it without false shame, a very handsome youth note to boot. I was not over tall indeed, measuring but five feet nine inches and a half in height, but my limbs were well made, and I was both deep and broad in the chest. In colour I was, and my white hair notwithstanding, am still extraordinary dark-hued. My eyes were also large and dark, and my hair, which was waxy and wavy, was coal-black. In my deportment I was reserved and grave to sadness, in speech I was slow and temperate, and more apt at listening than in talking. I weighed matters well before I made up my mind about them, but being made up, nothing could turn me from that mind short of death itself, whether it were set on good or evil, on folly or wisdom. In those days also, 
I had little religion, since partly because of my father's secret teaching, and partly through the workings of my own reason. I had learned that to doubt the doctrines of the church as they used to be set out. Youth is prone to reason by large leaps, as it were, and to hold that all things are false because some are proved false, and thus at times, in those days, I thought there was no God, because the priests said that the image of the Virgin of Bungay wept, and did other things which I knew that it did not do. Now, I know well that there is a God, for my own story proves it to the heart. In truth, what man can look back across a long life and say there is no God? When he can see the shadow of his hand lying deep upon the tale of years. On this sad day of which I write, I knew that Lily, whom I loved, would be walking alone beneath the great pollard oaks of the park of Ditchingham Hall. Here, in Grubswell, as the spot is called, grew, and indeed still grow, certain hawthorn trees that are the earliest to blow of any of these parts, and when we had met at the church door on Sunday, Lily said that there would be bloom upon them by the Wednesday, and on that afternoon she would go out and cut it. It may well be that she spoke thus with design, for love will breed cunning in the heart of the most guileless and truthful maid. Moreover, I noticed that, though she said it before her father and the rest of us, yet she waited to speak till my brother Geoffrey was out of hearing, for she did not wish to go maying with him, and also that as she spoke she shot a glance of her grey eyes at me. Then and there I vowed to myself that I would also be gathering hawthorn bloom in this same place, and on that Wednesday afternoon, yes, even if I must play truant and leave all the sick of Bungay to nature's nursing. Moreover, I was determined on one thing, that if I could find Lily alone, I would delay no longer, but tell her all that was in my heart. No great secret, indeed, for though no word of love had ever passed between us as yet, each knew the other's hidden thoughts. Not that I was in a way to become a fiancée to a maid who had my path to cut in the world, but I feared that if I delayed to make sure of her affection, my brother would be there before me with her father, and Lily might yield to that to which she would not yield if once we had plighted troth. Now, it chanced that on this afternoon I was hard put to escape to my tryst, for my master, the physician, was ailing and sent me to visit the sick for him, carrying them their medicines. At the last, however, between four and five o'clock, I fled, asking no leave. Taking the Norwich Road, I ran for a mile and more till I had passed the manor house and the church turn, and drew near to Ditchingham Park. Then I dropped my pace to a walk, for I did not wish to come before Lily heated and disordered, but rather looking my best, to which end I had put on my Sunday garments. Now, as I went down the little hill in the road that turns past the park, I saw a man on horseback who looked first at the bridle path, that at his spot turns off to the right, then back across the common lands towards the vineyard hills and the Waveney and then along the road as though he did not know which way to turn. I was quick to notice things, though at this moment my mind was not at its swiftest being set on other matters, and chiefly as to how I should tell my tale to Lily. And I saw at once that this man was not of our country. He was a very tall and noble-looking, dressed in rich garments of velvet, 
adorned by a gold chain that hung about his neck, and as I judged, but about forty years of age. But it, it was his face which chiefly caught my eye, for at that moment there was something terrible about it. It was long, thin, and deeply carved. The eyes were large and gleamed like gold in the sunlight. The mouth was small and well-shaped, but it wore a devilish and cruel sneer. The forehead lofty, indicating a man of mine, and marked with a slight scar. For the rest, the cavalier was dark and southern-looking. His curling hair, like my own, was black, and he wore a peat-chestnut-coloured beard. By the time that I had finished these observations, my feet had brought me almost to the stranger's side, and for the first time he caught sight of me. Instantly his face changed. The sneer left it, and it became kindly and pleasant-looking. Lifting his bonnet with much courtesy, he stammered something in broken English, of which all that I could catch was the word Yarmouth. Then, perceiving that I did not understand him, he cursed the English tongue and all those who spoke it, aloud, and in good Castilian. "'If the signor will graciously express his wish in Spanish,' I said, speaking in that language, "'it may be in my power to help him.' "'What? You speak Spanish, young sir?' he said, starting. "'And yet you are not a Spaniard?' though by your face you may well be. Caramba! But it is strange! And he eyed me most curiously. It may be strange, sir, I answered, but I am in haste. Be pleased to ask your question and let me go. Ah, he said, perhaps I can guess the reason for your hurry. I saw a white robe down by the streamlet yonder, and he nodded towards the park. Take the advice of an older man, young sir, and be careful. Make what sport you will with such, but never believe them and never marry them, lest you should live to desire to kill them. Well, here I made as though I would pass on, but he spoke again. Ah, oh, pardon my words. They were well meant, and perhaps you may come to learn their truth. I will detain you no more. Will you graciously direct me on the road to Yarmouth? For I am not sure of it, having ridden by another way, and your English country is so full of trees that a man cannot see a mile. I walked a dozen paces down the bridle path that joined the road to this place, and pointed out the way that he should go, past Ditchingham Church. As I did so, I noticed that while I spoke the stranger was watching my face keenly, and as it seemed to me, with an inward fear which he strove to master and could not. When I had finished again, he raised his bonnet and thanked me, saying, "'Will you be so gracious as to tell me your name, young sir?' "'What is my name to you?' I answered roughly, for I dislike this man. "'You have not told me yours.' Ah, oh, no, indeed, I am travelling incognito. Perhaps I also met a lady in these parts. And he smiled strangely. I only wished to know the name of one who had done me a courtesy, but who, it seems, is not so courteous as I deemed. And he shook his horse's rein. I am not ashamed of my name, I said. It has been an honest one so far, and if you wish to know it, it is Thomas Wingfield. I thought it, he cried, and as he spoke his face grew like the face of a fiend. Then before I could find time even to wonder, he had sprung from his horse and stood within three paces of me. A lucky day! Now we will see what truth there is in prophecies, he said, drawing his silver-mounted sword. A name for a name, Juan de Garcia gives you greetings, Thomas Wingfield. 
now strange as it may seem it was at this moment only that there flashed across my mind the thought of all that i had heard about the spanish stranger the report of whose coming to yarmouth had stirred my father and mother so deeply at any other time i should have remembered it soon enough but on this day i was so set upon my tryst with lily and what i should say to her that nothing else could hold a place in my thoughts this must be the man i said to myself and then i said no more for he was upon me sword up i saw the keen point flash towards me and sprang to one side having a desire to fly but as being unarmed except for my stick i might have done without shame but spring as i would i could not avoid the thrust altogether it was aimed at my heart and it pierced the sleeve of my left sleeve of my arm passing through the flesh no more yet at the pain of that cut all thought of flight left me and instead of it a cold anger filled me causing me to wish to kill this man who had attacked me thus and unprovoked in my hand was my stout oaken staff which i had cut myself at the banks of hollow hill and if i would fight i must make such play with this as i might it seems a poor weapon indeed to match against a toledo blade in the hands of one who could handle it well and yet there are virtues in a cudgel for when a man sees himself threatened with it he is likely to forget that he holds in his hand a more deadly weapon and to take to the guarding of his own head in place of running his adversary through the body and that is what chanced in this case though how it came about exactly i cannot tell the spaniard was a fine swordsman and had i been armed as he was would doubtless have overmatched me who at that age had no practice in the art which was almost unknown in england but when he saw the big stick flourished over him he forgot his own advantage and raised his arm to to ward away the blow down it came upon the back of the hand and lo his sword fell from it to the grass but i did not spare him because of that for my blood was up the next stroke took him on the lips knocking out a tooth and sending him backwards then i caught him by the leg and beat him most unmercifully not upon the head indeed for now that i was victor i did not wish to kill one whom i thought was a madman as i would have done then i caught him by the leg and beat him most unmercifully not upon the head indeed for now that i was victor i did not wish to kill one whom i thought a madman as i would that i had done but on every other part of him indeed i thrashed him till my arms were weary and then i fell to kicking him and all the while he writhed like a wounded snake and cursed me horribly though he never cried out or asked for mercy at last i ceased and looked at him and he was no pretty sight to see oh indeed what with his cuts and bruises and the mire of the roadway it would have been hard to know him for the gallant cavalier whom i had met not five minutes before but uglier than all his certs was the look in his wicked eyes as he lay there on the road on the pathway and glared up at me now friend spaniard i said you have learned a lesson and what is there to hinder me from treating you as you would have dealt with me who had never harmed you and i took up his sword and held it to his throat strike home you accursed whelp he answered in a broken voice it is better to die than to live to remember such shame as this no said i i am no foreign murderer to kill a defenceless man you shall away to the justice to answer for yourself the hangman is a rope for such as you then you must drag me hither he groaned and shut his eyes as though with faintness and doubtless he was somewhat faint 
Now, as I pondered on what should be done with the villain, it chanced that I looked up through a gap in the fence, and there, among the grubs while oaks, three hundred yards or more away, I caught sight of a flutter of a white robe that I knew well, and it seemed to me that the wearer of that robe was moving towards the bridge of the watering, as though she were weary of waiting for one who did not come. Then I thought to myself that if I stayed to drag this man to the village stocks or some other safe place, there would be an end to meeting with my love that day, and I did not know when I might find another chance. Now, I would not have missed that hour's walk with Lily to bring a score of murderous-minded foreigners to their deserts, and, moreover, this one had earned a good payment for his behaviour. Surely, thought I, he might wait a while till I had done my love-making, and if he would not wait, I would find a means to make him do so. Not twenty paces from us, the hall stood cropping the grass. I went with him, and undid his bridle rein, and with it fastened the Spaniard to the small wayside tree as best I was able. "'Now here you stay,' I said, "'till I am ready to fetch you.' and I turned to go. But as I went, a great doubt took me, and once more I remembered my mother's fear, and how my father had ridden in haste to Yarmouth on business about a Spaniard. Now today a Spaniard had wandered to Ditchingham, and when he learned my name had fallen upon me, madly trying to kill me, was not this the man whom they, my mother feared? And was it right that I should leave him thus, that I might go maying with my dear? I knew in my breast that it was not right, but I was so set upon my desire, and so strongly did my heart-strings pull me towards her, whose white robe now fluttered in the slope of the park hill, that I never heeded the warning. Well had it been for me if I had done so, and well for some who were yet unborn. Then they had never known death, nor I the land of exile, the taste of slavery, and the altar of sacrifice. End of chapter 3 Read by Patrick 79《Chapter Four of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter Four Thomas Tells His Love. Having made the Spaniard as fast as I could, his arms being bound to the tree behind him, and taking his sword with me, I began to run hard after Lily, and caught her not too soon, for in one more minute she would have turned along the path that runs to the watering, and over the bridge by the Park Hill path to the hall. Hearing my footsteps, she faced about to greet me, or rather as though to see who it was that followed her. There she stood in the evening light, a bough of hawthorn bloom in her hand, and my heart beat yet more wildly at the sight of her. Never had she seemed fairer than as she stood thus in her white robe, a look of amaze upon her face and in her grey eyes, oh, that was half real and half feigned, and with the sunlight shifting on her auburn hair that showed beneath her little bonnet. Lily was no round-checked country maid with few beauties, save those of her health and youth, but a tall and shapely lady, who had ripened early to her full grace and sweetness. And so it came about that though we were almost of an age, yet in her presence I felt always as though I were the younger. Thus in my love for her was mingled some touch of reverence. "'Oh, it's you, Thomas,' she said, blushing as she spoke. "'I thought you were not. I mean, that I'm going home as it grows late. "'But say, 
why do you run so fast and what has happened to you thomas that your arm is bloody and you carry a sword in your hand i have no breath as yet to speak i answered come back to the hawthorns and i will tell you no i must be wending homewards i have been among the trees for more than an hour and there is little bloom upon them i could not come before linny i was kept in a strange manner also i saw bloom as i ran oh indeed i never thought that you would come thomas she answered looking down who have other things to do other than go out maying with a girl like me but i wish to hear your story if it is short and i will walk a little way with you so we turned and walked side by side towards the great pollard oaks and by the time we reached them i had told her the tale of the spaniard and how he strove to kill me and how i had beaten him with my staff now lily listened eagerly enough and sighed with fear when she learned how close i had been to death but you are wounded thomas she broke in see the blood runs fast from your arm is the thrust deep <laughs> i have not looked yet to see i have had no time to look oh take off your coat thomas and i may dress the wound nay i will have it so so i drew off the garment without pain and rolled up the shirt beneath and there was hurt a clean thrust through the fleshy part of the lower arm lily washed it with water from the brook and bound it with her handkerchief murmuring words of pity all the time to say truth i would have suffered a worse harm gladly if only i could find her to tend it indeed her gentle care broke down the fence of my doubts and gave me a courage that otherwise might have failed me in her presence at first indeed i could find no words but as she bound my wound i bent down and kissed her ministering hand oh she flushed red as the evening sky the flood of crimson losing itself at last beneath her auburn hair but it burned deepest upon the white hand which i had kissed oh, why did you do that thomas she said in a low voice then i spoke i did it because i love you lily and do not know how to begin telling of my love i love you dear and have always loved as i always shall are you so sure of that thomas she said again there is nothing else in the world of which i am so sure lily what i wish to be as sure of is that you love me as i love you for a moment she stood quiet her head sunk almost to her breast then she lifted it and her eyes shone as i had never seen them shine before can you doubt it thomas she said and now i took her in my arms and kissed her on the lips and the memory of that kiss has gone with me through my long life and is with me yet when old and withered i stand upon the borders of the grave it was the greatest joy that has been given to me in all my days too soon alas it was done that first pure kiss of youthful love and i spoke again somewhat aimlessly it, it seems then that you do not love me who love you so well if you doubted it before can you doubt it now she answered very softly but listen thomas it is well that we should love each other for we we were born to it and have no help in the matter even if we wish to find it still though love be sweet and holy it is not all for there is duty to be thought of and what will my father say of this thomas i do not know lily and yet i can guess i am sure sweet that he wishes you to take my brother geoffrey and leave me on one side 
then his wishes are not mine, Thomas. Also, though duty be strong, it is not strong enough to force a woman to a marriage for which she has no liking. Yet it may prove strong enough to keep a woman from a marriage for which her heart pleads. Perhaps, also, it should have been strong enough to hold me back from telling of my love. No, Lily, the love itself is much, and though it should bring no fruit, still it is something we have won, it for ever and a day. You were very young to talk, Thomas. I am also young, I know, but we women ripen quicker. Perhaps all this is but a boy's fancy to pass with boyhood. It will never pass, Lily. They say that our first loves are the longest, and that which is sown in youth will flourish in our age. Listen, Lily, I have my place to make in the world, and it may take me time in the making, and I ask one promise of you, though perhaps it is a selfish thing to seek. I ask of you that you will be faithful to me, and come fair weather or foul, will wed no other man till you know me dead. It is something to promise, Thomas, for with time comes changes. Still, I am so sure of myself that I promise, nay, I swear it. Of you I cannot be sure, but things are so with us women that we must risk all upon a throw, and if we lose, well, good-bye, her happiness. Then we talked on, and I cannot remember what we said, though these words that I have written down remain in my mind, partly because of their own weight, and in part because of all that came about in the after years. And at last I knew that I must go, though were we were sad enough at parting. So I took in my arms and kissed her, so closely that some blood from my wound ran down her white attire. But as we embraced, I chanced to look up, and a sore sight that frightened me enough, for there were not five paces from us, stood Squire Bozard, Lily's father, watching all, and his face wore no smile. He had been riding up by the bridle path to a watering ford, and seeing a couple trespassing beneath the oaks, dismounted from his horse to hunt them away. Not till he was quite near did he know whom he came to hunt and then he stood still in astonishment. Lily and I drew slowly apart and looked at him. He was a short, stout man with a red face and stern grey eyes that seemed to be starting from his head with anger. For a while he could not speak, but when he began at length his words came fast enough. All that he said I forgot but the upshot of it was that he desired to know what my business was with his daughter. I waited till he was out of breath, then answered him, and Lily and I loved each other well, and were plighting our troth. "'Is this so, daughter?' he asked. "'It is so, my father,' she answered boldly. Then he broke out swearing. "'You light minx,' he said, "'you should be whipped and kept cool on bread and water in your chamber. "'And as for you, my half-bred Spanish cockle, "'know once and for all that this maid is for your betters. "'How dare you come wooing my daughter, you empty pillbox, "'who have not two silver pennies to rattle in your pouch? "'Go, win a fortune.' and a name before you dare look up to who she is. That is my desire. I will do it, sir, I answered. So, you apothecary's drudge, you will win name and place, will you? Well, long before that deed is done, that maid shall be safely wedded to one who has them, and who is not unknown to you. Daughter, say now that you have finished with him. I cannot say that, father, she replied, plucking at her robe, if it is not your will that I should marry Thomas here, my duty is plain that I may not wed him. But I am my own, and no duty can make me marry where I will not. While Thomas lives, I am sworn to him, and to no other man. At least you have courage, hussy, said her father. But listen now. Either you will marry where and when I wish, or tramp it for your bread. 
ungrateful girl did i breed you to flaunt me to my face now for you pillbox i will teach you to come kissing honest men's daughter without their leave and with a curse he rushed at me stick aloft to thrash me and for the second time that day my quick blood boiled in me and snatching up my spaniard's sword that lay upon the grass beside me i held it at the point for the game was changed and i who fought with cudgel against sword must now fight with sword against cudgel and it had it not been for lily with a quick cry of fear struck my arm from beneath causing the point of the sword to pass over his shoulder i believe that truly that i should then and there have pierced a father through and ended my days early with a noose around my neck are you mad she cried and do you think to win me by slaying my father throw down that sword thomas as for winning you it seems that there is small chance of it i answered hotly but i tell you this not for the sake of all the maids upon the earth will i stand to be beaten with a stick like a scullion and there i do not blame you lad said her father more kindly i see that you have courage which may serve you in good stead and it was unworthy of me to call you pillbox in my anger still as i said the girl is not for you so be gone and forget her as best you may and if you value your life never let me find you two kissing again and know that to-morrow i will have a word with your father on this matter i will go since i must go i answered but sir i still hope to live to call your daughter wife lily farewell to these storms are overpast farewell thomas she said weeping forget me not and i will never forget my oath to you then taking lily by her arm her father led her away i also went away sad but not altogether ill-pleased for now i knew that if i had won the father's anger i had also the won the daughter's unalterable love and love lasts longer than wrath and here or hereafter will win its way at length when i had gone a little distance i remembered the spaniard who had been clean forgotten by me in all this love and war and i turned to seek him and drag him to the stocks the which i should have done with joy and been glad to find some one on whom to wreak my wrongs but when i came to the spot where i had left him i found that fate had befriended him by the hand of a fool for there was no spaniard but only the village idiot billy minns by name who stood staring first at the tree to which the foreigner had been made fast and then at a piece of silver in his hand where is the man who i tied here billy i asked i know not master thomas he answered in his norfolk talk which i will not set down half way to wheresoever he was going i should say measured by the pace at which he left when once i had set him upon his horse you set him upon his horse fool how long ago was that how long well it might be one hour or it might be too i've no reckoning for time that keeps its own score like an innkeeper without my help Halloks! how he did gallop off working those long spurs he wore right into the ribs of the horse and little wonder poor man and he daft not able to speak but only to bleat sheep-like and fallen upon by robbers on the king's road and in broad daylight but billy cut him loose and caught his horse and set him upon it and got his peace for his good charity looks but he was glad to be gone oh 
how he did gallop. Now you are a bigger fool even than I thought you, Billy Minns, I said in anger. That man would have murdered me. I overcame him and made him fast, and you have let him go. He would have murdered you, master, and you made him fast. Then why did you not stop to keep him till I came along, and we could have hailed him to the stocks? That would have been sport and all. You call me fool, but if you found a man covered with blood and hurts tied to a tree, and he daft and not able to speak, had you not cut him loose? Well, he's gone and this alone is left of him. And he spun the piece into the air. Now, seeing that there was no reason in Billy's talk, for the fault was mine, I turned away without more words, not straight homewards, for I wished to think alone a while on all that had come about between me and Lily and her father. But down the way which runs across the lane, to the crest of the vineyard hills, these hills are clothed with underwood, in which large oaks grow to within some two hundred yards of the house where I write, and this underwood is pierced by paths that my mother laid out, for she loved to walk there. One of those paths runs along the bottom of the hill by the edge of the pleasant river Waveney, and the other, a hundred feet or more above and near the crest of the slope, or to speak more plainly, there is but one path shaped like the letter O placed on its side, the curved ends of the letter marking how the path turns upon the hillside. Now I struck the path at the end that is furthest from the house, and followed that half of it which runs down by the river bank, having the water on one side of it and the brushwood upon the other. Along this lower path I wandered, my eyes fixed upon the ground, thinking deeply as I went, now of the joys of Lily's love, and now of the sorrow of our parting and of her father's wrath. As I went, thus wrapped in meditation, I saw something white lying upon the grass, and pushed it aside with the point of the Spaniard's sword, not heeding it. Still, its shape and its fashioning remained in my mind, and when I had left it some three hundred paces behind me, and was drawing near to the house, the sight of it came back to me as it lay soft and white upon the grass, and I knew it was familiar to my eyes. From the thing, whatever it might be, my mind passed to the Spaniard's sword, with which I had tossed it aside, and from the sword to the man himself. What had been his business in this parish? An ill one, surely. And why had he looked as though he feared me, and fallen upon me when he learned my name? I stood still, looking downward, and my eyes fell upon footprints dead, stamped in the wet sand of the path. One of them was my mother's, I, I could have sworn to it among a thousand, for no other woman in these parts had so delicate a foot. Close to it, as though following after, was another that at first I thought must have been made by a woman. It was so narrow, but presently I saw that this could scarcely be, because its length and moreover that the boot which left it was like none that I knew, being cut very high in the instep and very pointed at the toe. Then, of a sudden, it came upon me that the Spanish stranger wore such boots, for I had noted them while I talked with him, and that his feet were following those of my mother, for they had trodden on her track, and in some places his alone had stamped their impress on the sand, blotting out her footprints. Then, too, I knew that the white rag that I had thrown aside, it was my mother's mantilla which I knew and yet did not know, because I always saw it set daintily upon her head. In a moment it had come home to me, and with the knowledge a keen and sickening dread. 
why had this man followed my mother and why did her mantilla lie upon the ground i turned and sped like the deer to where i had seen the lace all the way the footprints went before me now i was there yes the wrapping was her and it had been rent through by the rude hand but where was she with a beating heart once more i bent to read the writing of the footsteps here they were mixed with one another as though the two had stood close together moving now this way and now that in struggle i looked up the path but there were none then i cast round about like a beagle first along the river side then up the bank here they were again and made my feet that flew and feet that followed up the bank they went fifty yards and more now lost where the turf was sound now seen in the sand or loam till they led to the bowl of the big oak and were once more mixed together for here the pursuer had come up with the pursued despairingly as one who dreams for now i guessed all and grew mad with fear i looked this way and that till at length i found more footsteps those of the spaniards these were deep marked as of a man who carried some heavy burden i followed them first they went down the hill towards the river then turned aside to a spot where the brushwood was thick in the deepest of the clump the boughs now bursting into leaf were bent downwards as though to hide something beneath i wrenched them aside and there gleaming whitely in the gathering twilight was the dead face of my mother end of chapter 4 recording by patrick 79